Hello, everyone. This is criminal profiler Pat Brown, and today I'm going to be exploring the mind and the crimes of Jeffrey Dahmer. Uh, he's, he's an interesting character in the sense that he does something that most serial killers don't, which is he doesn't rape them when the victims when they're alive. He kills them, and then he messes with them, and then he goes further than that. And that's what shocks so many people. He also has a pretty high kill rate of 17. Um, and also, this is the most peculiar part. A lot of people feel very sorry for Jeffrey Dahmer. They don't have that same feeling for many other serial killers. They despise and think they're all disgusting. But Jeffrey Dahmer, in spite of the things he did and how grotesque and gruesome it was because they found so many body parts in his apartment and, and in all stages of decomposition and he clearly chopped them up and, and put them in vats to, to uh, eliminate the parts of their bodies and he had skulls in there. I mean, you can't say this guy's pleasant, but yet there's a lot of people who just say, I kind of feel sorry for the guy. And so I'm going to explore why that is and what kind of person was Jeffrey Dahmer? Uh, was he insane? Was he sane? Uh, you know, is, can we give him any kind of leeway here? Um, and what about his family? What, what was their problem? And so I'm going to explore all of that today. If you'd like to be here for these weird, freaky things, <laughs> be in the chat room. <laughs> Please do join in. Okay, we do have um, a way to do that. You can join Patreon. It, uh, the chat room is a patron-only chat room that keeps it lovely and friendly and people who are truly interested in profiling and not just people stopping by for kicks. Um, but you can join join Patreon and, and participate. Uh, also, please do subscribe to the channel. That helps greatly. Do like the video. Uh, click on the notification so you find out about the new stuff coming out. Um, there's other ways to support the channel. Books, the little dollar sign below. And that's all I'll say about that. And let's go on to <sighs> Jeffrey Dahmer. All right. So um, I don't tell stories. So I'm going to tell you where you can get the information that is a story uh, and get all the de all the details if you're interested in all the details. And if you're if you're new, um, uh, just coming in uh, later, you're not in the chat room and you just just found this video and you'd like to explore more before the video, I do recommend doing so. One is the very popular one that just came out on Netflix. It's the Dahmer one, um, which is called Monster, the Jeffrey Dahmer story. It is a, a reenactment. Uh, it is not a, a documentary. It's, it's a show showing what happened uh, with extraordinarily good actors. I will say this right up front, fabulous acting all the way through. Um, it's very emotional. It, it takes you on the entire journey of the victims and of Dahmer. I have some issues with the show and some of the families had issues with the show. Um, uh, my number one issue is that I thought they showed Dahmer being a little too romantic and, and the people getting together with him being too romantic. And that really wasn't, I think, what happened. So I think they did a little too much of that. I think they also... Uh, as far as Dahmer's father and mother went, they, I think, exaggerated that way too much, especially the father was always freaking out and shaking and all kinds of things. And and that really bothered me because when I read uh, his the father's story, I see him in a different light than I see in that show. Um, there were issues, definitely, and there were issues in the marriage that broke up. Uh, but I don't see that he, I think it was just, I was overdone in the show and that, that kind of bothered me. So those were two things that bothered me in the show. Um, some of the families thought that they didn't like the fact that their, their children who were murdered were, you know, being uh, depicted in this show and, you know, meeting Jeffrey and all this kind of stuff. However, uh, I thought it showed that victims in a very fine light, I really do, uh, a very kind light. And I think it helped the viewers understand what the victims encountered and what the families encountered and what the people around Jeffrey Dahmer dealt with. So I think I don't feel too badly about this particular um, show. I pretty much liked it very much. And I'm going to talk about one segment, which I thought was fantastic, well, still with some reservations. Um, however, if you want more solid documentary stuff, uh, I recommend this one, which is, con um, these are conversations with a killer, the Jeffrey Dahmer tapes. This is a three-part series. And it takes you through 
uh, how everything went down and who was participating, the detectives, the, the defense, the prosecution and psychologists and psychiatrists, I found that much more, had a lot more information. And you also hear Jeffrey Dahmer talking, which I thought was interesting because you hear his own voice uh, in being asked different questions. And I thought that was fascinating. And then this, I also read this book. This is, this is Lionel Dahmer's book about his son and what he, he's trying to let parents know. Maybe you should have seen something coming. He, I think it's a combo book. I think he's still trying to explore how the heck this could have happened what he could have missed. He's wondering what he could have, what he contributed to the whole disaster. Um, and he's also trying to warn people, hey, maybe there were signs that, that, we, that were there and you just didn't do, didn't do anything about it. And so it's, it's a warning book to, to parents as well. And I, I, I think that's a good idea. I think that's needed uh, for a case like this. And for other parents out there with the sons and daughters who are questionable. <laughs> um, so anyway, so that's a, uh, what I'm going to be talking about in here. So let's let's go to the beginning. Well, first of all, let me just read you the the quick Jeffrey Dahmer uh, Wikipedia piece because if you've never encountered Jeffrey Dahmer's history before, haven't seen any of these shows, you just don't know. Okay, so I'm going to go there uh, let you know who Jeffrey Dahmer was in the shortest way possible. Uh, Jeffrey Lionel Dahmer. Uh, he was born in 1960. Uh, he was known as the Milwaukee Cannibal or the Milwaukee Monster. He was an American serial killer and sex offender who committed the murder and dismemberment of 17 men and boys between 1978 and 1991. Many of his later murders included necrophilia, cannibalism, and the permanent preservation of body parts, typically all part of the skeleton. Although he was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, schizotypal uh, personality disorder, and psychotic disorder, so I'll get I'll get to the the psychology later in the show as to what I think his actual problem was because these these labels were being given during the actual trial, especially from the defense uh, because they were trying to prove he was not 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 sane and they wanted an insanity you know, defense there so he would go not go to prison. However, in spite of being those labels, he was found to be legally sane at the trial. He was convicted of fifteen of the sixteen murders he had committed in Wisconsin and was sentenced to 15 terms of life imprisonment on February 17th, 1992. Okay, so, and then um, he uh, was later sentenced to a 16th one, um, and then he was beaten to death by Christopher Scarver in 1994, a fellow inmate, and that killed Jeff Jeffrey Dahmer and ended this saga. Now, so that's his basic, uh, the basics about Jeffrey Dahmer. Um, so now, uh, what I want to point out next is his childhood, because the question is, was he born that way? People always ask, is it is it nature or is it nurture? Was he born that way and the family could do nothing about it? Or was he born perfectly fine and then the family screwed him up? Or, as I personally believe, it's a combo of both, that we come into this world with some level of personality and no type a type b whatever we're somebody we're not just a total blank slate we're somebody and then we 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 boom we come up against our environment our family our community and everything that is around us the world we live in and that we either deal with it well or we don't and i think this is the case here so uh so i want to point out about basically about how he grew up and i think you know, he certainly had a problematic background. There's no question about it. And one of the similar things that we see um, in the in this kind of background, uh, here he is, he's not a little kid, here's he a teenager, and here he is actually in prison with his dad, who still stood by him in spite of everything. Um, he, uh, there is something I find in common with almost all serial killers. And that is some kind of attachment disorder that somewhere in their very early years, they did not attach well to the people around them. It's possible because the people around them didn't attach to them, which left them going, well, <laughs> screw you too. You know, you don't that care that much about me. I don't care that much about you. I got to take care of myself. And what, what is interesting is a lot of times when you meet families of serial killers, they don't seem like bad people. It's not like, they, you know, it's always presented as if 
that child was raped and, and sexually assaulted by one of one of the family members or that they were beaten mercilessly. But a lot of times that's not true. The family seems to be okay. And the other children in the family seem to be okay. But this one seems to be really screwed up. Why? What's up with that? Well, because somewhere when that child was born, something didn't go well. Uh, in this particular instance, um, Jeffrey's father, Lionel, is a scientist. And sometimes people who are very, very intellectual, very scientific, have a kind of, um, they're not the warmest characters in the world. They, they have a tendency to, to not express as much. And they also have a tendency to be so involved in their work. And he was massively involved in his work, studies, his research, all that. He didn't have that much time to do all those other things. Now you do see he was a father. You know, there are videos and times when you see him being a father, but I think he was a good portion of the time, an absent father, uh, busy, busy, busy. And he even says, it's kind of interesting and sad. He, some, he says, I look back and I, I see Jeffrey out of the corner of my eye, like coming through the room as if he wasn't really connecting with Jeffrey. Jeffrey was just in the background an awful lot. Um, now, that might be okay. A lot, a lot of kids have survived that, except that mom seems to be a kind of a mess. And mom had a lot of issues. She had, yeah, she had a lot of issues. Let me put it that way. In, in the movie uh, version, the, the Netflix version, they kind of destroy her completely. And they have, they have him, hating on her the whole movie. And I didn't see one shred of that in the book. As a matter of fact, he kind of didn't mention her in the book. I think he basically just said she had she had problems after he was born. Um, she had problems with uh, depression. She had problems with the whole pregnancy. Um, so the, it seems to me she had some problem have, being pregnant and having a child and then raising that child. She was she was had too much of her own problems to deal with him. That's where I think the attachment disorder sets in. Um, so I think, yes, I think from very young age, he started having issues with anybody being there for him outside of the, ba the basics. And the basics were there. He had a home, he had a couple parents. Uh, he, he played, they gave him toys to play with and bicycles. So it wasn't like he didn't have those things but somewhere he missed something and he separated from other human beings in the sense that he did not trust them and therefore he did not want to need them in any way, shape or form. And I'm going to differ from many people who think that he, the reason he committed these crimes was fear of abandonment. And I do not believe that is true at all. Um, he did have some times in his life where he probably did feel abandoned by his parents. They weren't paying enough attention. Uh, at one point when the parents broke up and he was, oh, he was already over 18, the mother took the younger son and left and left him alone in the house. So yeah, I'm sure that wasn't a thrill. Um, uh, but I don't think that was the reason he was killing people was fear of abandonment. I think that's, that's incorrect. And I'll explain why. I think it's because you can't feel abandoned by people you don't give a crap about. <laughs> if you don't see other human beings as human beings, as real people, as people you want to be with at, in a relationship, if you don't see that, you can't be abandoned by something you don't even have a desire for. I don't think he had a desire for that. I think what he had a des desire for from the time he was a little kid was power and control, like many serial killers. He lacked that in his life. Somehow he just felt like he was floating around, nothing was working for him. He wanted to have total control. And that's what he, that's that's why he ended up the way he did. Anytime he, somebody else told him he had to do things, he wasn't so thrilled about that because he didn't get enough out of doing those things to feel like that was worth anything. I think the people that he did things for, like his grandmother, and people thought, oh, he loved his grandmother. I don't buy that. I think it was a place to stay and no place to go. And he had to obey certain rules and he was good at obeying certain rules in order to be able to continue what he wanted to do. So that is my theory on, you know, with growing up, I think he's got these issues. Now, I want to point out a couple interesting things that did happen when he was growing up, which I think is the fault of the adults in his life. And and, and it's concerning. Um, here's, a, by the way, a couple of pictures of him when he was a, a teen. 
Um, and here we have, this is, I, I took it out of the father's book. Years later, when I asked Jeff why he liked to come, this, liked this particular woman, this was, a, uh, this was one of the teachers. I think she was an assistant teacher. He responded with little more than a verbal shrug. She was nice to me, I guess. He answered in the lifeless monotone that had become his voice by then. So, but this was re what really th threw me. And it's in the movie too. Um, he decided he liked her well enough to give her a bowl of tadpoles. He gave them to her innocently as an expression of his affection or that he wanted to make use of her. I don't know which one there. I don't know how much affection he had, but at that point he thought this person, this person is being nice to me. I'm going to do something nice for her. Later, however, he felt that the teaching assistant had given these same tadpoles to Lee, which is another kid. In revenge, Jeff later sneaked into Lee's garage, found the bowl of tadpoles and poured motor oil into the water, killing them all. Now, it's interesting because he wasn't into killing animals that we know of. Actually, he did like his dog. He also liked his cat, who his family made him leave the cat when they moved to another home, which I thought was weird and was unexplained because the other home was not a rental home as far as I knew. So why the heck did he have to leave his cat? And that was kind of cruel. And I thought this teacher was kind of cruel too. He gave her a present and she takes his present, hands it off to another kid. He's luck She's lucky that he didn't pour the motor oil on her, you know, uh, but killed the tadpoles in revenge. So he grew, he developed hate for people. Hate for people because he felt that they they didn't care for him and that they they were they were um, unaware of his needs and I think this is very true because his father says let me see if I can find it in here um, his father says here later on and I think this is absolutely true so hold on a second I got to find where I wrote it because it was it was three things that I thought were interesting. Ah, his dad said, my, my life became an excuse in avoidance and, and in denial. In other words, um, his dad avoided dealing with Jeff Jeffrey even when he was young. He denied what Jeff was doing when he was young. He minimized everything. Why is that? Because Jeff had enough weird things going on that he should have said, hey, my kid's kind of screwed up. <laughs> He should have theoretically, even if it didn't help, took him to get help, but he did not. He just minimized everything Jeff did and said, well, I guess it's a phase or this or that, but these things were ongoing and he just didn't do anything about it. He was too wrapped up in his work. Um, his wife was too wrapped up in her emotional problems. Nobody did anything and nobody saw it. And maybe if they had seen it, this would have helped out. Not necessarily that they could have fixed him, but maybe they could have made sure he didn't get into stuff that he shouldn't be getting into. Um, there's a big thing made in the in the show about his father showing, uh, he, he found some roadkill and there were some bones there and, and Jeff got all excited about the bones and like, yay. And daddy's like, hey, you know, that he's showing interest in this, so we should do taxidermy. I, as far as I know, that actually isn't true. Um, father wasn't really into showing him any taxidermy because there were no there were no st animals that were taxidermy in his house what jeff supposedly did was he did get excited about dead animals so what he did was he found roadkill and he took them to a private location and then he explored their innards put, took them apart chopped them up put a head on a stick you know one of the a dog's head on a stick he had a private little graveyard in the forest of the woods, which is supposedly his family didn't know about. Uh, so he was experimenting with that. The concept of he was obsessed with death um, and what you know, and 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 having that control because when the when the animal's alive, you don't have that control. It has a personality and it has its own needs. And sometimes I don't know where do you really how much he really liked his dog and cat. <laughs> maybe that especially the cat probably annoyed him because cats just don't care what you think and but he had this little thing going on I want to point out about the taxidermy thing because this I think is one of the silly things about the movie so the concept is that his dad introduced him to taxidermy and this is some kind of horrifying thing <laughs> well first of all his father was a scientist so it's not unusual that a scientist would actually be interested in that kind of thing but that supposedly didn't happen. But let's say it did. I have done taxidermy. I was a homeschooler. And I remember one time some, some bird like whacked into the window. And I'm like, science project. 
<laughs> I'm like, this will be interesting because my kids haven't, we didn't do that much science stuff. And if you're a homeschooler, you know what I'm talking about. Science was the one area that we sucked at because it was like too much work. And so we did nature things and, you know, we had lots of pets. We didn't really like doing all the science stuff. We were looking for classes to take care of that mess. Um, but I found, oh, look, I got a dead, whatever it was, a dead pigeon, I think was the first one. What the heck, maybe it's a crow. I don't know what it was, hit my window, dead. Anyway, I thought, oh, kids, we can learn about biology and we could do taxidermy. And okay, now you think I'm really freaking weird and I can't say that's not true. So anyway, we did this. And so my kids thought, okay, dead animal. They weren't all like, like freaked out about it. We had had many animals in our life. We had all kinds of reptiles and amphibians. And my daughter had her pet rat, Molly. And um, hey, Molly. Oh, no, it was Millie. Sorry, it's not you, Molly. <laughs> and Molly's in the chat room going, I'm a rat. No, Millie. Her name was Millie. Um, we had a big pet pig. Um, we had a pot belly pig for 20 years. I mean, we had all kinds of cool animals. And but then I saw him like, hey, we could make do some taxidermy. We can learn about the, the animal. So we did. We actually did learn about the animal. We saw the parts of the animal. Uh, so my kids saw the heart and the liver and all that kind of crap. And then we did the taxidermy things and we made a taxidermy pigeon. I was pretty impressed. And then somebody had a, one of my friends had like a, I guess a, a dead cardinal and or a blue jay. I can't remember which one. She said, here, you know, I know you're doing taxidermy. You can do this one next. And I know it was in my freezer. So, you know, I had renters in my house. So I was like, about that bird in the freezer. <laughs> ah! Like I have a dumber household. It's like creepy. Um, but this is homeschooler type thing. So just because his father might have taught him about animals and taxidermy. I mean, there are fathers who take their sons hunting and I'm not a big fan of hunting, but fathers take their sons hunting, they kill a deer, they, 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 they do what they need to do with a deer and their kids don't turn into serial killers. So just because a person is involved in hunting or taxidermy or whatever else doesn't mean this is what it's, you know, it's gonna turn you into something weird. So that, that his son might have for a minute thrown some bones into the air is meaningless to me. And, and this is what Lionel asks himself. He said, do I, do, should I have been freaked out by this? Or is it just something boy does? And I shouldn't have been freaked out. So he's going back and he's second guessing himself on everything. Um, my concern with, with Lionel is that there were enough pieces of evidence as Lionel was getting, uh, J Jeffrey was getting older that things were not quite right with the boy. And perhaps this was a time to start saying, hey, maybe you need some help and get him that help. Again, not necessarily that it would have worked because if, if Jeff was a psychopath, he would just play, you know, play the uh, therapist and get out of there. So, but I would have liked to have seen the family put a little more effort into it, but they didn't. And I think they made some poor choices, but that doesn't mean they're bad people. Okay. They're just people trying to survive, people trying to do the right thing. And they, I think they really just did not understand that their son was that screwed up. Um, and you don't a lot of times see that. I mean, I see, I've seen kids who are five years old and I'm like, boy, that's a little psychopath. <laughs> Watch him. Uh, I see that, but most people don't. And so not until they get to be teens, sometimes do people start wondering what's wrong with their kid. And then they think it's something teens go through. And so they let it go again. And then the kid leaves home. And a lot of times you don't see what happens after that. So um, so that's kind of my, uh, some of my thoughts. Let me see what else I had in his childhood. Oh, well here, um, so I just want, I just want to look at this, uh, to see if there's anything I missed here on this childhood. Dad did increase, notice increasing disconnection, but he didn't do anything about it because this is important because he was not causing a problem or outwardly raving and shrieking. They left him alone. And this sometimes happens if a kid has like, um, for example, uh, they're, they're just a behavioral problem they take them someplace because that behavioral problem makes them miserable. But if the kid's just quiet and squirrels into a corner, hides behind his door, a lot of times parents are just like, at least, I don't, at least he's not doing anything bad. Huh, at least he's not bothering us. And so they let him stay there. And so a lot of times that is overlooked. Um, and he also became an alcoholic when he was a child, and all into his teen years. And that was also overlooked by his dad and probably his mom who was either doing, doing medicines herself or wasn't even there. Um, 
but he was drinking in school. So, I mean, there, there was clearly an alcohol problem going on that was being ignored as well. Now, when you look back at their photos, um, it's hard to tell a lot about their home life because back in those days, we didn't take that many photos. I mean, this is, we're talking early. I mean, I'll look at my pictures from when I was growing up and there's like 10. <laughs> Either my parents didn't care about me or it's too expensive to take pictures and develop them, which was true. Now we have, we can, we got our phones, you know, working all the time and we can take a thousand pictures. Today, if we have a phone and we take no pictures of our kids, we might wonder. But back then, you can't really tell. So looking at a few pictures, I really don't know much about that. Now, what happens to him when he gets a little older? And well, before I go into that, I'll just check on in on your comments to see if anybody has anything to say. Um, uh, unless it's extreme. Yeah, hold on a second. I've got to go back here. Um, Hold on a second. I'm just trying to I'm trying to go back up here just to see if anybody has any particular comments on that. <laughs> oh, Michaela says, well, that's what I want. A gift of a bowl of tadpoles. Ew. Yeah, I mean, theoretically, a child might think that they should go to the parents and say, what should I give my teacher? And that might be the, you know, give her a, a flower, make her a nice card. Uh, I again, I don't think the parents were connecting with, with Jeff. So he thought tadpoles were cool and being the person i am i'd like the tadpoles <laughs> i'd rather have them <laughs> okay but i'm weird um so but yes that is kind of maybe not the thing that the best choice to give to give someone but what the teacher did which was horrible to me is she should have taken those suckers home and then I don't know what she's going to tell Jeff later if they don't turn into frogs, but um, she can say, well, my granddaughter and I are, are, are enjoying them or something. Oh, she was a young teacher. Okay. My, <laughs> my niece and I are enjoying them. And then he might've just forgotten about it and not asked how they turned out. Or she could say, you know, Hey, they eventually grew up and we let them go in the pond, but to actually give them to another kid in the class. So that kid in the class could tell Jeff that the teacher gave away his present. <sighs> I'm sorry, teacher. That was sucked. That was a mean ass thing to do. I just, uh, 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 I'm just pissed off about that myself. That's just, I don't think that changed, changed, um, Jeff's life, but I just think it's, it's, it was a mean thing to do. All right. Now, um, to go on to the next part, what happened to him after they, um, he had a, by the way, he had a brother who apparently was less trouble. Uh, and then he graduated from school. Now, um, what happened to him after he got out of school? And I think this is where things get interesting for, for Jeff. Uh, so he wasn't popular in school. Looks like many of us weren't. Anyway, um, they claim he had a brief relationship with a boy, uh, a sexual relationship, but that, but not sexual, sexual, but just as, you know, a little budding romance. I don't know how true that is because again, I don't know how well he connected with anybody. Um, so, but they thought he was a class clown. He did some silly things. His grades declined. He graduated high school. All right. So now he's turned 18. His parents were, parents divorce happened then. And Joey's got custody of the younger son. And then she split town with the younger son. All right. Now here's what happened next. Jeffrey committed his first murder in 1978, three weeks after his graduation. He picked up a hitchhiker named Stephen Mark Hicks was almost 19. He lured the youth to his house on the pretext of drinking. Hicks, who had been hitchhiking to a rock concert, said, okay, and they'd have a few beers. According to Dahmer, and here's one of the things you got to watch out for, according to Dahmer. Now, there's this concept that Jeffrey Dahmer told the truth about everything. He was like, hey, he was, you no, know, he got caught, you know, he, after he was, uh, you know, arrested, he was one of the most open and honest guys ever. Lie. That's not true. He, his father said he lied a lot in his life to get away with things and to manipulate people. And I believe absolutely he was a pathological liar in many ways. Now, a lot of times when a serial killer is caught, they will tell you what you already know to sound like you're cooperating because that you're, you know, hey, I'm, I'm willing to tell you the truth. And oftentimes there are things that aren't told. They're left out. Now, but just because he gives gruesome information it makes, makes people think, oh, well, if he'd tell us that, he must really be telling us the truth. No, no. He, first of all, you probably like telling those things because it's fun to watch people's faces go, oh my God. 
that's a nut, that's a kick. And he also likes telling those things because he enjoyed it when he did it. So he likes telling the story. I'm going to ask you guys, how often do you tell stories over and over again, as long as you can remember who you told them to? Uh, <laughs> hey, let me tell you about my trip to the, <laughs> the Andes. And you just, you know, and then you tell your story again because you have a great memory of that and you like retelling the story and watching people's reactions. Hey, so do serial killers. He can't kill anymore. He wants to tell the stories. So don't give Jeffrey Dahmer that much credit that, oh, he's so honest and above board. No, he's not. He's a serial killer. So don't believe everything he says. So here's the story from Jeffrey Dahmer about Hicks. According to Dahmer, the sight of the bear chested Hicks standing at the roadside stirred his sexual feelings. Although when Hicks began talking about girls, he knew any sexual passes he made would be rebuffed. I don't think he gave a crap whether he was gay or wasn't gay. He got them into the house. He, Jeffrey Dahmer liked the male physique. He liked a handsome body. Why? Because he didn't care about a relationship. He just wanted the body. So whether they weren't going to have a relationship anyway. So whether the guy liked girls or guys didn't really matter. The reason Jeffrey was so successful when he finally got um, into the gay bar scene was because he could get men to go with him. He didn't want women to go with him because he wasn't interested in female bodies. He was gay in that sense. He, he didn't want female bodies. He wanted male bodies. So yeah, you go look for gay men because they're interested in you too. But in this case, this guy was you know just a hitchhiker. So he happened to be not gay. Um, so, so then the claim is after several hours of talking, drinking, and listening to music, Hicks wanted to leave. And I didn't want him to leave. Dahmer bludgeoned Hicks with a 10-pound dumbbell. He later stated he struck Hicks, tw Hicks twice from behind and with a dumbbell uh, as, oh, as Hicks sat on a chair. He later stated, um, let's see, wait a minute. Oh, then when Hicks fell unconscious, he strangled him to death with the bar of the dumbbell. Okay. Then he stripped the clothes, explored his chest with hands, and then he masturbated. And then he dragged the body to the basement. And then he dissected the body and he buried the body and did all the other fun, fun things he does to bodies. All right. This, the whole thing here comes to, he wanted to leave. And this is where people keep saying, oh, he was upset he wasn't going to have, the guy, he wanted a relationship. He wanted, he didn't want the man to leave. No, you don't. <laughs> the problem that Jeff had was not that he, the man was going to leave the relationship, which was not even existing. He wanted to keep the body and the body was leaving. He wanted the body, not the relationship. He wasn't like, oh, people are leaving me again. Ah, stop that, guys. I don't know who started that story. No, he wanted the body because he liked something he could 100% control, 100% power over. He did not like pillow talk, you know? He didn't want to have to have sex with a guy. And then the guy, hey, you have sex with a guy. The guy expects you to do stuff too, you know? Mm -hmm. And then he might want to sit there and chit chat with you, pillow talk. He didn't want to do that crap. And maybe he didn't want to see the, the guy again and have to go through a relationship process. He wanted the guy unconscious. And if he could have kept the guy unconscious and had sex with him and did what he wanted to, and then the guy just goes away, fine. The problem was a lot of times you can't make the guy unconscious enough, so you kill him. So he killed this guy and then he got to play around with the body. It, over time, uh, Jeffrey Dahmer experimented with all kinds of ways of making somebody, the body, available to him. He tried drugging them. He tried drilling their heads and putting stuff in there to make them zombies. And then he ended up killing them just to, because that's the only choice he had to have the body. He'd like the body to last longer. So he tried a way to, you know, he should have been, he should have worked for a funeral home. I mean, <laughs> hey, guy, funeral home. Why are we in a chocolate factory? Go to work in a funeral home. He really missed his, his calling, I tell you, missed his calling. Hmm. So, um, so this is where I think people got it wrong. And I don't think they got it wrong from the beginning that he didn't want somebody to leave. So anyway, he killed him and that was in his own house. And by the way, this is another problem he ran into. He, he killed a guy in his house when his mom was, had already moved out and he was alone. Then he ended up at his grandma's house and he was able to kill there. And then he got chucked out of his grandma's house and he ended up in an apartment. The first time he was on his own, really. And he got stuck in an apartment because he couldn't afford a house. And that's where the problems start. Because when you're in an apartment, you, you, there's not too many places to put the bodies, except, well, there isn't any place to put the bodies. 
where in the house you can put them in the cellar, you can put them in the woods nearby, you can all kinds of places you can hide bodies and you have a lot more freedom. But once you get into the apartment, you, you kind of, then you get, that's where you get the backlog, you know, and that's why he got caught with so many bodies in the apartment. But I want to talk about the, he went to college and that failed out. He failed out of college. And then they, dad said, well, okay, if you failed out of college, you're going in the army. And he did. He went in the army. Um, he was deployed, but the, <laughs> The army discharged him supposedly because of his alcohol abuse. They gave him an honorable discharge. And I want to stop right here. And this pisses me off so badly. The alcohol wasn't the only problem. He had problems following orders. There was, there was problems with him uh, assaulting other men, things that were un, they were not happy with and the men weren't happy with. They were, they were creeped out by Jeffrey Dahmer and his behavior. They're like, this guy is a weirdo, sicko dude. What happens a lot of times, I've seen this happen with other serial killers, is they don't want to have to fight to prove whatever this guy did. So they just give him either a general or an honorable discharge to just get him the hell out of there. A lot of times they do give him an honorable discharge so they don't have to write this whole thing up. And when that happens, that guy goes out into society and when he goes and applies for a job, they look at his record and he's got an honorable discharge from the army. And they go, oh, okay. And it, it isn't true. He was discharged because he was creepy and did creepy things. And they didn't want him around anymore. And that's the truth with Jeffrey Dahmer. And there's also a question whether Jeffrey Dahmer killed anybody while he was, I think he was in Germany. Um, is that where he was at? Uh, that's G West Germany, yes. Um, uh, there's a question whether he killed people in Germany. And that has not been proven yet, but it is an interesting question. So then he comes back. He lives with his father and his stepmother because his dad remarried, looks for work, but he's still drinking. Now he's, he's arrested for drunk and disorderly. All right. And, and dad tries to help him get out of, off of alcohol. All right. So then he and Dahmer's stepmother send him to his grandmother's house in West Allis, Wisconsin. Uh, supposedly, he displays some affection for her. So now they sick him, <laughs> sick, sick, not sick him, sick grandma with Dahmer. So your, your son has massive problems, so you send him to live with grandma. Thanks, honey. Ugh, just unbelievable. So anyway, supposedly this went well. He went to church with her. He undertook chores. He, he did work. He obeyed the house rules. He found employment as a phlebotomist. All right. He held a job for a total of 10 months before being laid off. And then he was, uh, and then he was another two months, uh, two years without any any work and mommy and grandmommy gave him money. This is the problem. Everybody sucked up to him. Everybody let him get away with everything. Um, and one of the things that happened, they showed us in the movie, he stole a mannequin from a store and his grandmother found this mannequin in the house, this male mannequin. Again, hey, if you're gonna stay in my house, you're going to a psychiatrist because I don't know why you got a male mannequin in here. Something's wrong with you, but they let it go. He had some excuse. Oh, you know, I just wanted to see if I could get away with stealing something out of a department store. Oh, that's normal. Hey, I don't care if you had sex with a mannequin. I still want you to go to psychiatrists. It's creepy. Actually creepy. <sighs> mm. So, yeah. So he's at grandma's house. Now, this is where things get really, really frustrating to me. Um, now, while he's at grandma's, um, let's see, wait a minute, where's the first thing here? Oh, here's an interesting thing. Shortly before losing his job, Dama was arrested for indecent exposure. On August 8th, 1982 at Wisconsin State Park Fair Park, he was observed to expose himself on the south side of the Coliseum in which 25 people were present, including women and children. For this incident, he was convicted and fined $50 in court costs. And here's the beginning of the failure of the criminal justice system, which drives me nuts. Um, let me see if I can find, um, because he, it wasn't like he was unknown to the criminal justice system. So sometimes what happens is the guy's got no record whatsoever, but, all, but this guy does have a record. He has a, he has an entire path of sexual problems, sexual crimes, and yet, Somehow the system just just ignored most of them, quite frankly. Um, I want to point out the this whole trajectory here. Um, hold on one second. I'm having I'm having 
Oh, different technical problem. <laughs> what? Come on. Now my, now my iPad doesn't work. Okay. I'm, I'm trying to pull this up because I'm trying not to, um, I'm trying to find the thing I want to show you. What the, oh, I've got the wrong guy. <laughs> Jeffrey McDonald, not Jeffrey Dahmer. Hmm. Same, different thing, different, different story. <laughs> okay. Um, let me see if I can find this here. Um, oh, oh, this is it. Uh, I'm going to get away. I want to get to that in a minute. Um, uh, okay. I can't get to that yet. All right. I'm trying to find the one where, hold on, just ig ignore this for a second. I'm just going to flip things. Okay. All right. Gonna, yeah. Okay. Okay. Never mind. I can't find it. So anyway, so he exposed himself in public. This is a sexual crime. Okay. He should have been labeled right there a sex predator. He should have gotten, he should have gotten jail time. He did not. And that's what happens. The same thing peeping toms. They don't get proper jail time. And they're not taken seriously. It's like, oh, that guy's a freaking weirdo. Yeah, he's a weirdo, but he's also a sex predator. Don't allow that to happen. You know, don't just ignore that. So anyway, he did get that. Um, that was the first one. Then he started He started his job at the, um, at the uh, chocolate factory. He started working at a chocolate factory. And he got his job. And then he... Uh, so the next thing that happened to him is he started going to bathhouses. Now, this is really important because going to bathhouses, um, this is another point where if the police had done a proper investigation, they would have found out he had spent a lot of time in these bathhouses and they had started saying, you can't come back because in the beginning he tried to get with men in the bathhouses and then they went to their room and they wanted like reciprocal stuff. <laughs> and I told you, he doesn't like reciprocal stuff. It's like, no, it's a one-way street here. I don't want any of that. By the way, just lay there and don't say anything. That didn't go over well. So he started drugging them with, um, what did he drug them with? Um, halcyon. He drugged them with Halcyon. And the idea then was that they're out of it and he can molest them in any way he likes. Now, this was known to have happened in the bathhouses. They threw him out. What was the big problem here? This is what bugs me. If he gave Halcyon to the guys, and then molested them while they were out. This was sexual assault. Sexual assault. He should have been arrested. The bath, the, the owners of that bathhouse should have gotten together the guy who was the victim, and they should have brought the police in and arrested the son of a bitch. And then he would have. This would have been the second thing on his record. Okay, you're already doing creepy things over here. Now you're doing creepy things over here. Um, didn't happen. And they just threw him out of the bathhouses. And so he had a bad name and he couldn't you know, go back to a lot of the bathhouses because he kept doing this over and over again. So he was a known person for literally sexually assaulting other men. Why was this just, why do you just look the other way? This is not okay. This is, this is a true 100% sexual assault and more than one. And yet, and this, I've, I thought, I know the bathhouses probably weren't on good terms with the police. And this whole, this whole, you know, the, the, this whole area of the gay world, which they probably didn't want the police sn sniffing around on, that's probably. And so they didn't, they didn't go there. So we have a problem with a lot of issues of what's accepted and what's not accepted and how we deal with things. So Jeffrey went on his merry way. So, uh, so that didn't go well. Um, then after this bath bathhouse memberships were revoked, um, he decided he, he, so he went on with other, other behaviors. Now check this out. On September 8th, 1986, Dama was arrested upon a charge of lewd and lascivious behavior for masturbating in the presence of two 12 year old boys as he stood close to the, I can't pronounce the name of the river. He initially claimed he had merely been urinating, unaware that there were witnesses, witnesses to a crime but soon admitted the offense. The charge was changed to disorderly conduct in spite of the witnesses. And on March 10th, 1987, he was sentenced to one year probation with counseling. So we had a sexual, he did, he did something already he was caught for, for which is a sexual predator uh, crime. He was in the bathhouses, nobody reported those properly. Then he, in front of children, 12 years old, now, now, now mind you, that 12 years old, it's on the border, so he's not necessarily a pedophile, but he likes teen boys. That's a different group. But he was doing stuff in front of them. 
He's a sexual predator. He should have been arrested and put in prison, but he wasn't. He was given probation again. Hmm. And oh, I want to mention this. Um, oh, I forgot to bring the book out. Um, there's also an issue of when he got out of the army, um, he went down to Miami for a while. And um, he was in the area where Adam Walsh was murdered. And there are people who believe, and there's a book written about it uh, that, and I did a whole show on this. So I'll put the link to Adam Walsh down there just so you can check that out. Because Dahmer was considered a possible suspect in that because he was there at the time and there were people who believed they saw him and Adam Walsh was, head was, he was decapitated. So the concept is this sounds like it could be Jeffrey Dahmer. Now, many people think it's not him because A, he goes for teen boys and this was a child. And B, he's so honest. He's, he, he admitted all these crimes he did. All right, I'm going to address both of those right now. One, I've seen many serial killers who will kill nothing but older people, grown adults, and then kill off a child, rape and kill a child. Why? I don't know. Maybe they couldn't find an adult. Maybe they had an opportunity. Maybe at that time they were wimpy and didn't think they could handle an adult, so they tried it on a child first. Don't know. So he could have been in Miami, thought, oh, here's this kid. I can grab him. I can... Now he's cute. Maybe he maybe he went off and decided to go for a kid. Number two. Oh, he always tells the truth. Yeah, he told the truth in Wisconsin. That's not a death penalty state. Florida, death penalty state. And also maybe embarrassing that he doesn't want to admit he killed a kid. So if he goes to prison, people don't like people kill kids as much as you know, like maybe he can handle older ones, but not a little little teeny kid, especially not John Walsh's son. So I mean he still got killed in prison anyway, but <laughs> but there's many reasons why he could have, could have. I'm not saying he is the killer of, uh, of, um, of Adam Walsh at all, because it's, there's, it's hard to prove exactly who was where and who most likely did it. I think it's an unsolved crime at this point. Uh, but I see why he could have. He was in the area and some people thought they saw him. Could have done it and not confessed to it because of uh, Florida being a death penalty state and because he was a kid. Uh, so he could have. So just pointing that out. But anyway, now he's got this record. He's got two incidents where he has is, is a sex predator. He's, he's a sex offender and a sex predator. But doesn't get much. Um, doesn't, they just don't do much about him. He gets the probation crap. He eventually goes to a place called the Ambassador Hotel. And he, he, he takes this guy from, a, he meets him in a, let's see, did he meet him in a bar? Met him in a bar, uh, Stephen Toomey. Uh, went back to the hotel. Um, he uh, he said he intended to just drug him and lie beside him, but when he woke up in the morning, he found that he was he had been beaten to death, and uh, he didn't know how it happened. He blacked out. Do we believe Dahmer? Yeah, he drank a lot. Did he really black out, or does he just not want to admit that instead of the kind way of just drugging him, that he actually brutalized this guy? Maybe he didn't want to admit it. I don't know, but he did kill him, and then he managed to get him out of the hotel, which is amazing, and in, in, in suitcases and in a suitcase. I don't even know how he did it, but he got him out of there and he didn't get caught. After that happened, he got very excited. Oh, by the way, there's supposed to be nine years he didn't commit any crimes. Is that true? Possibly. Sometimes serial killers take time off because they're afraid of getting caught and they, whatever. Uh, they find other ways to amuse themselves. It's possible he didn't kill for nine years. It's also possible he did and he's just not telling us. And why is that? Because he's told everything else. Maybe it was the victims he killed he doesn't want to admit to. Maybe he just likes to pretend that he tried really hard for nine years and see how see how hard he worked and it worked. And then he just lost his mind after the Toomey murder. So he couldn't help himself. Who knows? He's a, he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a liar. So you can't believe what he says. All right. So after this happened, he encountered a 14-year-old Native American male prostitute named James Doxteter. He lured the youth to his home with $50 for nude photos. And at, um, at, at their residence, he, um, they supposedly engaged in sexual activity before he, before he drugged him and strangled him. Oh, really? How do we know they engaged in sexual activity before he strangled him? Or did he just strangle them and then engage in sexual activity? Again, this is Dahmer's word. The guy's dead. You know, Dahmer's the only one who can explain what happened. All right. And so then he dismembered him. Then he uh, also lured Ronald Flowers to his house and gave him drug coffee. But then grandma called, is that you, Jeff? 
And then he had to take him to the hospital and dump him because he, uh, like his grandma knew what was going on down there. And in September 1988, grandma asked him to move out because of his drinking and because of young men coming to her house at night and the foul smells coming from the basement. So then this is where things got kind of bad. Um, all right. Now he moves. All right. He moves into an apartment. Uh, so he goes, he goes from grandma's house and he's going to now, um, this is new apartment. This is new apartment. Um, this is, oh, I want to point out this about gra grandma's house. Oh, I have to point this out about grandma's house. Um, this is one of the cases where they should have been able to catch this guy. So what happened was he went to this bar, picked up the guy, I forget which one it was now, um, picked up the guy and the, the guy's friend drove them to this look and this area. And he is like, and, and the two of them got out of the car together. Okay. Uh, not at grandma's house, but somewhere in a corner here. And then the friend drove away thinking, okay, they're just going someplace to have sex. Right. The, the guy's never found again. Right. Or whatever. I can't remember if he was found or not found, but anyway, he disappeared. Now, when they were looking to find out what happened to this kid, I don't understand why if he disappeared on this corner, they didn't look around the area for the sexual predators who were on probation and find Jeff Jeffrey Dahmer and then say to the guy, does this look like, uh, put up a you know photo lineup and say, does this look like the guy? And he's like, yeah, that's the guy. He was in the bar with him. He wouldn't know what he looked like. That, that, that astounds me that that police work was not done. It uh, appalls me. So anyway, now, now, um, now he moves off to, um, now he's in Milwaukee in an apartment. Um, so, let me see here a second. Let me see where my pictures are here. Um, I wonder if, what is that picture? Oh, I can't get to that yet. Okay. Um, I want to get to that in a second. Oh, no, sorry. Hold on a second. <laughs> go away. Go away picture. I want a different picture. Ah, okay, go away. Ah, go away. Hold on a second. <laughs> Gosh, I hate it when I things mess up with me. All right. So anyway, they, he moves to Milwaukee. Okay. Um, I think I have something down here. About, I just want to show a picture of where he moved to in it. Now it has vanished from my, uh, yeah, it's vanished. That's weird. It was here and now it's not here. Hmm, interesting. Hold on one second, guys. Let's see if I can find it. Um, so he, he moves to Milwaukee to an, an apartment. And there's an, there's an important part about this, which is why I want to show the, at least the basic picture of where he moved to. Um, this is the apartment he moved into. Um, so, so he's in this apartment. Now, it's in a black area. It's it's relatively cheap. That's why he can afford it. So he moves into this apartment. And this is where the problem comes into because he cannot move people out of the apartment very easily, except maybe in suitcases, which some people do. But, you know, basically he's got this apartment and, and, and he's by himself so he can get away with things. He doesn't worry about grandma. But on the other hand, he's also got to... If he kills somebody in the apartment, he's got to deal with it. Now, this is where the next completely screwed up thing happens, which is just boggles the mind. All right. So this is the case of, let me find him here. Um, all right. This is a case where he gets his kid. Um, let me find that information here. Um, all right. Hold on a second. Where is it? Um, hold on a second. There is a kid who he lured to his apartment and he took photos of the, uh, this. He took some photos of him and and touched him, shall we say. Touch, I'm trying to find the thing here and I can't seem to find this. Info. Oh, here we go, okay. Oh, sorry, this actually, I got his new apartment, okay. Moved into it two days later after he gets into his new apartment. He is arrested for drugging and sexually fondling a 13 year old boy and he, who he lured, whom he lured to his home on the pretext of posing nude for photos. Now, this is the third offense it has to do with children. 
the third offense and this third offense. So first he's first he's exposing and then he's masturbating. And now he's now he's brought a child, a 13 year old to his apartment that he takes pictures of and fondles. This should have put him in prison for a long time. So there we have the sexual, it says sexual assault. He did a sexual assault. Now this guy, um, let me see if I can find, uh, his, his name is um, Norman Goldfarb, Dr. Norman Goldfarb, awesome guy. And I just went to look to see if he had any books. I love this guy. Uh, is, and he's in the um, conversations thing. He's just fantastic. Right straight on, straightforward, understands what he's dealing with. He said, he looked at this kid and he said, uh, Jeffrey. And he said, this guy is a sex predator. Uh, give him five to six years in prison. You know what they gave him? Yeah. They gave, he, he got some psychological evaluations Yeah, from him and from apparently somebody else. The evaluations revealed, this is from the defense team now, Dahmer harbored deep feelings of alienation. A second evaluation revealed Dahmer to be an impulsive individual, suspicious of others, and dismayed by his lack of accomplishments in life. His probation officer, the one who already knew who he was and that he was already a pervert, also referenced a 1987 diagnosis of Dahmer suffering from schizoid personality disorder. On January 30th, 1989, Dahmer pleaded guilty to the charges of second degree sexual assault of enticing a child for immoral purposes. Sentencing was sentencing for the assault was suspended until May. On March the 20th, uh, Dahmer commenced a 10-day Easter absence from work during which he moved back into his grandmother's uh, home. And maybe he didn't move to that apartment I just showed you. That was the that was the one where they eventually found everything. Sorry, must have been some other place. So he, he moved out to some crappy place. Then after this, he had to move back into his grandmother's house for uh, so that she could pay attention to him. So no, he wasn't in the uh, that Milwaukee apartment yet. So he, but he moves back into grandma's place. Now, so he's, get this, so he's January 8, 89, 89, he pleads guilty. Sentencing for the assault is on May, in May. So that already is five months right there. Two months after his conviction and two months prior to his sentencing for the sexual assault, he murdered his fifth victim mixed race, 24 year old aspiring model named Anthony Sears. This is the guy I said that his friend drove him there. This is the guy uh, whom Dahmer met at a gay bar. According to Dahmer on this particular occasion, he was not looking to commit a crime. However, shortly before closing time that evening, Sears just started talking to me. He lured him to his grandmother's apartment where the pair engaged in oral sex. Oh, really? We don't know because that's what Dahmer tells us. Before Dahmer drugged and strangled Sears. Well, I'm going to say if it was oral sex, he wasn't the one giving it. Okay. So anyway, then he chopped him up. So while he's on, while he's already been, he's he's already confessed to this 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 assault of a child. They let him out. The third time, this is the third time he has been involved in this. He's a he's a 100% sex predator, and they let him out again. They killed while they let him out. So another man died because they let him out. On May 23rd, he was sentenced to five years probation. Now, this is his third sexual offense. And this was a real solid hands-on sexual offense of a child. He gets five months probation and one year in the House of Correction with work release. <sighs> Permitted in order that he can keep his job. So they want to help him keep his job. No mind that the kid was assaulted and he's a danger to the community. They want to still let him out to go to his job and then come home. For a year and then he gets probation so he was uh two months before his scheduled release from the work camp he was paroled from this regimen his five-year probation was imposed began at this point he temporarily moved back into his grandmother's house i don't know grandma should have at this point why was anybody willing to have jeffrey dahmer in their house grandma already knew the guy's something really seriously wrong with him he's a creepo he's a sex a sex a, a sex assaulter i mean a child assaulter He's a sex predator. Why, Grandma, do you let him back in the house? You know, this whole family is very easy to manipulate and just easy to, okay, I'll help you out anyway. So anyway, then he, okay, so now he moves out of Grandma's house. Now he moves into uh, the, the apartment. Um, 
taking Sears mummified head and genitals with him. He goes, no, take the good stuff with you, right? So now located in a high crime area, the apartment was close to his workplace, was furnished in $300 a month. Uh, after moving in, he killed his sixth victim, Raymond Smith. Smith was a 32-year-old male prostitute. He lured to the apartment with a promise of 50 bucks for sex. He gave Smith a lace drink, a sleeping pills, and then strangled him, and then so on and so forth. And they took pictures of everybody that he killed. All right, so this goes on, and then there's then there's these all other many people that he that he does in, and so let me go further. So uh, let's see, I'm trying to get to the okay this guy, and this, there's there's a ton of them, but I want to get to Tony Hughes. All right, this this was the guy that was part of the um, uh, in the movie, um, Tony Hughes. Uh, Let's see, I think, wait a minute. Wait a minute, that's not, wait a minute, I'm getting confused here. <laughs> there's there's so many. I'm trying to make sure I get the right one here. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Okay, okay, it is Tony Hughes. Okay, Wikipedia was a little lame on this one. Okay, Tony Hughes is a, this is Tony Hughes and he is deaf, okay? And he was at a, a gay bar, and one of the things I didn't like in the portrayal, which I think the family was upset about too, was they portrayed him, and this is the guy who portrayed him. This guy's name is Rodney Burford, who is also deaf. Uh, and this is cool because the whole group of people that showed up in the film um, for an entire episode, and it's the favorite episode of everybody, everybody's signing, uh, sign language. And so they're really representing quite well how, how this, this group of, uh, of deaf, deaf gay men who were, who were at the bars and hanging out and having a good time. And I just thought that was, that was really cool. Now here's an, here's an example. He's signing to it with his buddy over here. Um, and what was also awesome about it was that they signed what's called BASL, BASL, that's, um, that's a uh, black American sign language. Okay. So now, and it's interesting. I sign, that's what I sign. Actually, I was an interpreter for many years and I sign Black American Sign Language because most of my clients were black. Um, so when I saw them signing there in the bar, I'm like, oh my God, you know, I understand everything. <laughs> it's really clear, you know, it was cool. It was cool. Anyway, so I was excited because it gave everybody the feeling of they, they, they killed the sound and you could see them signing and chatting and talking just like anybody in the deaf community does, regular folks having a good time. Um, and then he meets this guy in the bar. Now, this is important to point out because in the in the story they they did this whole romantic thing which the family disagrees with. They start showing them like this is the first time like Jeff has ever like met a guy he really really likes. And mind you, he doesn't sign. So you know, so in a bar when you're like hooking up, you just write a note and go, hey, you know. So apparently, um, he did find him attractive. You know, he's in the bar and he looked over and said, hmm, something. I like. And so he went over and wrote his name down and they left together. I do not believe as the family doesn't that, uh, that these two, not these two, because he's the actor, these two had some kind of ongoing romantic relationship because he fell in love with him and then didn't want him to leave that kind of bull again. They, they made it too much like, oh, they had sex together. And then he gets up and he's walking out going, I'll be back. And and then he's about to, oh, you can't leave. And then he leaves and you're like, oh, good, he got away. And then he returns because he forgot his keys, I believe. And so then when he turns around to leave again, he nails him and then kills him. And oh, it's so sad because he just didn't want to be abandoned. Garbage. I don't think that's true. I think this poor guy just found him attractive. It was a hookup. I don't agree with necessarily hookups like that, but they happen all the time in gay and non-gay communities. <laughs> Homosexual, heterosexual, people hook up. I think it's dangerous, but people do it. So he thought he was handsome. He thought he was handsome, which he is. He's a really handsome guy. Um, and Jeffrey wasn't that bad looking. And you see that little smile on his face? If you watch the actual conversations uh, with, with, with Jeffrey Dahmer, you will see they show some home movies. And he actually can be quite charming. So even though most of the time you hear him in this dead voice, supposedly according to everybody else around him, the people that met him, he could put on a show. He could make himself very attractive and very sweet, and people fell for that. So he's, he's not didn't he didn't have an ability to do that. So don't believe he didn't. So anyway, they hooked up, went back to the apartment, and he did what he did to everybody else. He killed him, and 
did things with his body. And, um, but I think he did a superb job. Um, he's also part of a show called Deaf You, which is fantastic. Um, so I thought that was the best episode as everybody else does because he comes across as such a nice guy. And, you know, not that the other guys weren't nice, but he just was a super nice guy and they did romanticize it too much, but it made him, you know, you got, you got close to him in other words. And then they brought you in emotionally. And then when he knocked him off, you really, really were pissed that, you know, he got, he got killed. Um, so I think that was, a, they, they, this was a dramatic thing where they were together with more feelings between them and that, that he had left the apartment and you thought, oh, he's safe and came back and you're like, darn it. Oh, no, no. And then he get, kills him. So, but that was still the best episode in my opinion, just because it, it, it really brought you emotionally into what the victims um, went through, in spite of the fact I don't think that's actually how it went down. So, but I thought it was quite fascinating. Um, so that was another one. And then we get to the most important one in the sense of how after the, okay, we've already got three incidences where uh, uh, Jeffrey Dahmer is in, he is considered a sex predator. He is listed three times. Although three times I just basically let him walk away, um, not have to, you know, be in prison. Three times, he's, he's not like unknown. So there is somehow no linkage going between one crime to the next, um, which is concerning. Um, so all these people are disappearing and nothing is coming up. Then we get the crime that everybody cannot believe um, happened. And, and this was, and this did not get him caught, which is why everybody is so pissed about the whole darn thing. And this is the case of this guy. Okay, I'm going to call him. <laughs> Let me get my information here. Um, Conorak, I think is uh, his first name. I can't pronounce his last name. <laughs> I'm not even going to try. Um, yeah, where's where's Con? Where is he? Where is he? So he he. Um, this is this guy. He's Laotian, I believe. Um, he is the brother of the young man who three years earlier. Jeffrey Dahmer was arrested for and convicted of sexually assaulting. That's his brother. His brother was the one that went up to Jeffrey's apartment to get that 50 bucks and did escape for whatever reasons, which make is sad. He just, he runs into Dahmer. Dahmer actually didn't know they were brothers supposedly. And I kind of believe that. So he was, um, he ran into him and, he said, come on back for the same, the same kind of routine. I'll pay you 50 bucks. And he went with him. Okay. Um, so he goes back to the apartment and, and Jeffrey drugs him. And he also drills a hole in his head to try to put stuff in it to try to make him a zombie. And it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't knock him out. And so he escapes So Jeffrey decides to go get some beer or something at a bar because he figures his, he's like under the weather there. So he escapes. And he's run down, he's running down naked down down the, the side of the apartments. And two young women find him, black women, and they stop and say, oh my God, this poor kid. And they put a they put a, something over him, they call emergency. The police show up. It's these guys. Uh, these are the two police officers that show up. Um, and these guys are, let's see, let me see if I get their names right here. Um, where did they go? Well, hold on a second. And eh, they're not showing up under my thing here. Um, uh, why are they lit not on the list here? Well, that's weird. Hold on a second. Oh, I'm on the wrong page. <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, so this is what happens here. Uh, so his name is, let me see if I get it straight, um, Conorak Synthesymphony. Okay. Something like that. 14 years old. Uh, he is the younger brother of the boy that was molested in 1988. He approached the uh, teenager with an offer of money to pose for Polaroid pictures, which, by the way, is, is what was much more useful than putting stuff on your phone these days, because at least Polaroids weren't seen by anybody. There were times when people actually took photos with cameras and sent them to be developed and were found like, this looks suspicious. Let me call the police. But So you use Polaroids back in those days. I mean, it's easier, you know, if you just, on the cell phone, hmm, not too bad until they find your cell phone. Um, so anyway, so he, while he was there, he gave them drugs, and then he decided he would um, drill a single hole into his head, and that happened. 
And then he hung out with uh, the guy and um, fell asleep, drink, drank some beers, fell asleep next to him. And then he left the apartment to drink in a bar and get more alcohol. He returned to the apartment, discovered him sitting naked on the, so he was out then. So the kid gets outside. Okay. The kid's outside now with the two ladies who got the thing around him. They've called the police and these two guys show up. And the names are John Balser, Balserzak and Joseph Gabrish. When they arrived, um, the, the um, Dahmer shows up at the same time and he convinces the police, hey, that's my boyfriend. And the women are like, this is a kid. This is a kid. This is not an adult. And, you know, the problem is, and I'll, I'll just have to be, you know, this, is, this can be a problem with an inability for people who are from a different race to recognize the, the age. And so Asian, uh, Asian men, Laotian, Laotians, Thai, um, some of the guys look younger than their age. So it may be that these guys, the police said, well, you know, it, it could be. He could be 18, you know, and, and, and he's, and Jeffrey's like, Hey, he's my boyfriend. Um, now, mind you, these two guys, the claim is, well, they didn't do anything because he was gay, but no, they were actually probably trying to be nice. Like, Oh, we're not, we're not, we're not homophobes. We, we can, we can, we can accept that these two guys are boyfriend and, you know, boyfriends, you know, they're trying, but they did do one thing, right. They went to his apartment. And this is where, I mean, there's a there's a dividing idea on this. And one is that they should have absolutely not allowed this boy because he looked young to go back with Dahmer just because Dahmer says it's his boyfriend. And I agree with that. They should have run a check no matter what. They should have said, guys, I need both, both your names. Dahmer, what's your name? And what's your boyfriend's name? Why didn't they ask what his boyfriend's name is? I'm going to guess they had no clue what his name was. I, I think Jeffrey remembered his name. He probably wouldn't have a clue. So if that's your real boyfriend, you would know first and last name. They never bothered to ask that question, which is stupid. And they should have run a check on both of them. And they would have found out Jeffrey Dahmer was a sex offender uh, of, uh, of children. And then they would have stopped this whole thing. He would have survived. Jeffrey Dahmer would have been caught and no one else would have been murdered. So yes, do I think these police sucked? Yes, they did. I don't think it's because they were anti, you know, homophobic or anything or anti-black, because neither one of them are black, actually. Some will claim they didn't listen to the two women because they were black. I don't think that's it. I think these guys go, they're probably boyfriends, just like he says, but, and they did one thing. They went to the apartment to make sure, that, to go away there and look. So Jeffrey, mind you, Jeffrey can be slick and talking, and I'm gonna point this out in a minute. He, he is a good manipulator. So in, the police weren't bright, I think, I think they failed in their job and I think they deserve to be fired and not reinstated. But I think they went to the apartment and here's what happened. The guy, the, the kid comes up and he sits on the couch and they think, okay. And then they see his clothes are folded neatly over here. And then there's this picture of him. And I only show the head. They, there's a new pictures of this kid. And they're thinking, this is this. We've got boy, pictures of his boyfriend, you know? And they went, okay, whatever. And they left thinking, we just got the drunk guy back to his that back to the apartment. That's all. They probably thought they were being actually modern in their thinking. That hey, you know, we're not we're not we're not gay ourselves, but hey, you know, we gay guys can do what they want. But they didn't do what they should have done, which is at least freaking ask, do you know this guy's name and run checks? Before you return a person you don't know is over the age of 18. Even if he was, it could be his boyfriend. He's, you know, Jeffrey Dahmer claimed he was over 18, but hey, he could have been boyfriends anyway and the kids would still be 15 years old. I mean, pimps do this all the time with their their their, their girlfriends who are, are working for them. They'll say, that that's my girlfriend. I'm, and she'll say, that's my boyfriend, but the girl will be only 14. <laughs> so they failed dismally. Um, but I wanna point out some of the things why Jeffrey was good at what he said. So there was some... The next door neighbor, this was the next door neighbor at the time. And he said, I thought this guy was my friend, you know? And then he says, everyone in the building felt sucker. This is after, this is after he's, uh, uh, Jeffrey Dahmer has been caught, not with this kid, but remember Jeffrey Dahmer, finally one guy got away and that's how Jeffrey Dahmer got caught. Everyone in the building felt suckered. We all felt that Jeffrey Dahmer had played us. It's really hard to become fond of someone to find out that actually that person had a dagger in your back. 
See, he people in the building actually did like him. He was good enough. You may not want relationships. He was good enough to play people. So do not believe that Jeffrey Dahmer is honest and always telling the truth. And he's just a sick man who can't control himself. No, he, he was a manipulator from very young and he manipulated his way in this building. That's how come people didn't suspect him. He seemed like, oh, first of all, a white guy moves into a, a building of African-Americans and they're like, hey, this guy's pretty cool. Back in those days, that was, that was you kind of like a guy who isn't racist, right? And guess what? Jeffrey Dahmer isn't racist. And I want to point that out here because this is something that I think they really, um, that, that has really been misunderstood. There, after, after, Jeffrey, after Jeffrey Dahmer was caught, finally, there, were, um, there, were, there was a lot of outrage in the community uh, because he wasn't caught sooner. And this I understand. I'm sorry, that's not it. When I'm looking, where did it go? Oh, maybe, here it is. Um, and they had the protests and everything. Officers failed to aid naked, bleeding boy, boy killed, boy, police hide misconduct. And there was a belief that, um, that the police, that racism was behind the police thing and racism was also behind Jeffrey Dahmer. Absolutely not. Jeffrey Dahmer was 100% not racist. <laughs> um, first of all, because he didn't care about politics very much or anything else or relationships. He just liked bodies. Now, when he was at his, he, he killed some white people, some white men, he killed Asian men and he killed black men. He did have a preference for black men. Why is that? Because he just liked the way they looked. People are attracted to different people even if you want them alive, you know, you know, well, some are attracted to blondes, some are attracted to uh, well, light skins, like milky white, some are attracted to dark skins. Everybody has their thing. Some people attracted to a cultural thing. Some people attracted to some structure of the face, the hair, who knows why people are attracted to think, to different aspects, but we are attracted to people. Jeffrey Dahmer, if he had his choice, did like handsome young black men. He thought they were beautiful, not, you know, the bodies, <laughs> he liked the bodies. That's what he preferred. That had nothing to do with race. He didn't kill them because of race. Also, people say, well, he chose them because they, they were gay and the police wouldn't pay attention. Well, Jeffrey Dahmer was sent was gay too. He picked them because that's what he liked. He liked men, he liked men, not women. <laughs> so of course he's gonna pick gay men. It's obvious. And did it happen to help him out that because of the gay bathhouses at the time when people started disappearing there was assumptions that people either moved or they got there there was a few this is when aids was in the rate it was like really bad um so they're you know did they did they move home and then die of aids they didn't people didn't know what happened to a lot of the people and that were coming into the clubs and the bathhouses so and jeffrey Dahmer was smart enough to use condoms when he raped his his bodies um so i guess he was worried about aids uh, you know uh, but he so I don't think this is not this was not it. Now, does that mean that the that there wasn't problems with under under um, under investigations in certain communities? Yes, because there's assumptions in certain communities. Oh, I guess they just wandered off. I just that's why same thing with prostitutes. Sometimes it's like, why didn't they why didn't they go after figuring out who killed these prostitutes? It's because sometimes prostitutes disappear for other reasons. They they have drug issues, so. There, that's the problem, or they they move to a new state to get you know get better work, uh, better you know, and then maybe their boyfriend made them move, which is a pimp. Maybe this, maybe that, or maybe this is a serial killer. But you, it's so hard to be sure until you get enough of them. And you're like starting to go, this is suspicious. Unfortunately, here Jeffrey Dahmer was in the system, and after this kid um, disappeared, is all you know. This is a weird, what is weird to me. After this kid disappeared. I don't understand how the family isn't saying, hey, you know, his brother was attacked by a guy right in this area, right in that building. Check out Dahmer. I don't, I don't understand what happened there. Uh, I can't seem to find information on why his, he wasn't linked to Dahmer sooner and, or ever. He was never linked to Dahmer. It was the guy who escaped that brought them into Dahmer's apartment and they found everything. So that whole thing just drives me crazy. Um, so Anyway, what I want to talk about, I'm going to just stop in the chat room and I'm going to talk about, is he sane or isn't he sane? Um, uh, Lisa says, are you saying he just wanted sex with unconscious men and not a relationship and was just saying that to cover himself? Yes. 
I don't think he had any interest in a relationship whatsoever. Not whatsoever. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, maybe pack and follow up with John Wayne Gacy <laughs> to put me off of food for life. I, uh, I could do it. <laughs> I could use some of those COVID kilos to go away as well. Um, yeah, uh, definitely could. I should. <laughs> um, uh, let's see what I was here. Uh, this is very true. The police missed the forest through the trees. It, absolutely. It was it was not good police work all the way around from from the beginning, you know, and not good. And our criminal justice system, letting him off over and over and over again is absolutely appalling. And I don't know what, you know, his parole officers, probation officers, they were useless pieces of crap. Um, so, oh, that, that's um, that's that's uh, <laughs> that's that's ex that's exaggerated about the sandwiches and stuff that that's that's drama. That's drama. Um, I would say this is true, Florence. He maybe thought black men's murder wouldn't be investigated as much. That may be true, but I don't think that was his thing. I think he simply he simply liked black men, and he's allowed to do that, even though he's not allowed to kill them. That would be problematic, and was problematic. Um, oh, this is this is true. Molly says the boy was not able to speak properly. The police should have looked into his pupils with a flashlight for a proper response and sent to a hospital. Absolutely. Absolutely. That was, again, they had somebody who was in a, in a state which, you can, what, was he inebriated or was it even something more, which it was. Um, they should have protected him and, and sent, had an ambulance come, take him to the hospital and have him checked out. But they didn't. They just sent him, sent him over with, with Jeff because they, when they got there, they're like, oh yeah, they're boyfriends and he's just drunk. That was, it was, they should have lost their jobs. There was no excuse. And I don't, again, I don't think it was racism or anti, it was not racism or homophobia. It was stupidity and terrible police work, terrible police work. And that's the way it goes. Um, <laughs> Benny, women are not attracted to me. They call me ugly until they hear how much money I make. Then they call me ugly and poor. <laughs> Benny, you always, you always amuse me. You always amuse me. Um, let's see. Uh, Let's see. Um, police don't, Michaela said, please don't take women's rape allegations seriously, domestic violence seriously, and they don't know how to respond to LGBTQ community. These all become problems because it's always a he said, she said, he said, he said, she said, she said type of thing a lot of times. And they get so many of these calls that, and a lot of times people back out, even though they, they make the phone call, they back out. And, it, and the evidence thing is an issue. So yes, there's a problem with that, but there's also a problem with the whole issue in general. It's so difficult. It is absolutely difficult. Um, and and yeah, it's difficult. But uh, but the, but this was not a case of that. Uh, this is a case where you had a naked boy on the streets. At least for God's sakes, you should have checked. Find out his. I say, just ask Jeffrey Dahmer what his name is. I don't think they did it because believe me, I can't remember his name. I don't think Jeff is going to remember his name. Um, uh, Lisa says, they're glibness, perhaps. There's an interest, an uh, area of interest for me, psychopaths and how they become, become, I'm looking for Lisa S's next thing. Yeah, become something. Yeah, they, they do learn how to manipulate because that's how they get over on people. That is how they get their power. They can't get their power through normal behavior because it doesn't work for them. They don't feel like they're winning. They've already believed they're losers. You have to understand this. They think they're 100% losers and nobody, nobody cares for them and nobody is going to do anything for them. So they learn early on to get over on people. And the more they get over on people, the more they enjoy that power. And so they learn to lie really, really well and to manipulate people. So that is... um. That is very important. Um, oh, that's a good point. Uh, I will always wonder how, Marie, Marie says, I always wonder how psychopaths can be so sure of themselves to dare do these crimes. But I guess it's because they overrate themselves and have too much experience in fooling people. Yes. And what happens with, the, there's an arc here. In, in, in the beginning over here, this is where you screw up. And, and Jeffrey Dahmer almost got caught in the beginning. And then he got better at what he did. And then he got careless and he started doing too many of the crimes and he was drinking too much and he screwed up. That's how he got caught. And so that's how it works. It's this arc. Um, but 
They do. I mean, they spend their entire days manipulating it, people and getting away with things and find and they try things over and over again until they learn how to do it better. So that doesn't mean they're always successful the first time. They, they might try something and it doesn't work. So then they try something different. And then somebody might even say that doesn't work. You should do this. And they do that. And like, it works. So they they built they build this almost a. a it's almost like they 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 are writing their, these scripts and they use these scripts with different people to, because they know these things work, whether it be a smile, whether it be some a fake confession to, oh, yeah, I'm I'm kind of scared when I go out at night. You know, whatever it is, they're going to use things that actually uh, will will work with people. And, and uh, Jeffrey Dahmer got away with it for a long time. So one of the points is I don't know what he said to the police. But if he could, if he could confuse the judge, uh, I don't know who, whoever was sentencing him, all his neighbors who were black, for years, his family didn't figure things out. He might have been pretty good talker, you know. And you you hear his dead voice, you don't think so. But listen to this. Look at those home videos. You'll see he can be very, he can be pleasant. And I think well, if he was putting on the pleasant act. They fell for that stuff. And so did the men who went with him. They're like, oh, my God, he's kind of cute and he's he's friendly and pleasant. Sure, I'll go with him, you know, and they don't realize it till it's too late. And um, but he's got to have something going for him. Um, interesting about this, Sarah, he didn't actually want a sex slave. Because there are ways to have sex slaves without actually killing them. A sex slave could be somebody who simply agrees to be your sex slave. That's done all the time. Um, they can be a dungeon master, you know, uh, so he can have somebody who likes bondage, who wants to be tied up. He could tie up a guy and, and then do everything to the guy and the guy would not object because he likes that kind of stuff. Why wouldn't Jeff do that? I'll tell you why. Because he doesn't want to interact with a human being. He does not want any kind of relationship. That's why people don't get this. They think he wants the relationship. If he did, he could have a, a master-servant relationship, you know? He could do that. And he had opportunities to do that, but he didn't take those opportunities. He didn't want that person to even be awake. He wanted them out of it. He just wanted their bodies. He wanted to play with them like the mannequin. The mannequin was just a little hard, you know, a little hard, you know? He wanted the soft, luscious body with the parts still attached. And the places he could do things with. He could have gotten, you know, these days there are better dolls, uh, blow-up dolls out there these days that are pretty realistic. Maybe in this day and age, he could have gotten a good, good doll and that gut doll would have worked for him. But they didn't have those dolls back then. They were just, uh, they were, those are the terrible ones, blow of plastic. They were, didn't have any good, good, good parts to them. <laughs> Nowadays, it's amazing what they got out there. But he didn't have that option. I don't know if he even had that option whether he would have taken it. Maybe he still wanted the real thing, just not the live real thing. Just wanted the body because that's what gave him the big, big cheap thrill. Um, oh, he does. I, I, Sarah, I do not think he was interested in the killing part at all. He was not. And he, he said that. And I that part, I actually agree with. He wasn't into the killing. The killing was something he had to do to get what he wanted, which was the body to be used as he wished. The killing was something he, he, he wasn't into that at all. That was not his big thing. Um, so, yeah, he was manipulative enough to blend in. All, all Most serial killers can do enough to blend in with societies most of the time. Now, I want to go to, was he sane or was he insane? Because this is, is a incredibly important thing because when he went to trial they tried like hell to make him insane but he was found sane and he um then he was convicted and he went to prison which he eventually got killed in prison but he was found sane now how does this work and let me let me and this is really important and it gets this is a this is a tricky topic and so i'm going to try to present to you some of the issues of it. So was he sane or not? Okay. Let me see. I, I got, I got some of these people here. So, okay. I don't want to point this out. Lionel was hoping that the court would give Jeffrey the help he needed. So he was hoping he would be labeled insane and go to psychiatry, uh, get a unit. Dad, you didn't do anything to get him help when he was young. 
sorry, that was one of your failures. And he is not going to get any help at this point in time. He is absolutely not. He is, in my opinion, a 100% psychopath. Psychopaths can't be cured. They can only be kept from doing things. Now, let's see what some of the other things said. Okay, the defense said he had a schizotypal and borderline personality disorder. And this defense also said they have frantic attempts to avoid real or imagined abandonment. See, here we go with the abandonment thing again, that the reason he did these things was because of fear of abandonment. Not true. Again, that's not it. He didn't care. He was not interested in a relationship and wasn't worried about being abandoned. He just wanted to get them so he could get their bodies. The abandonment thing did not exist. So that is just unfortunately something that they keep they keep pressing, which I didn't find accurate. Now here, let, let me show you something else. This is his, this was also one of his defense attorneys. Her name is Wendy Patricus. Um, she was only 20 something at the time. They, they brought her in because they thought she could so, you know, she could talk to him softly and get information, which she did. And you'll hear that in the conversations uh, video. You hear a lot of what she said, him talking to her. But she didn't, she's, she's an innocent and naive, and she doesn't have the background uh, to understand him. But they also thought if she was in court next to him, people feel sorry for him because he's so sweet. Uh, and he's next to a sweet girl. Okay. So anyway, he, one of the things that happened was she would tell him things and she would lead him. And then he'd say this, I think that must have, yeah, been on uh, my thinking. <laughs> he was perfectly willing to agree with anything that she put out there because that would help him out in the court case. Now here, uh, let's see. It's one of the things she said, and again, this is what, oh, this is what I, you, he was supposedly thinking, but it's not what he was actually thinking. Um, hold on a second. I want to pull up this behind me. Um, and so I can talk about it. Hold on one second. I forgot to move it over. One of my failures here. What the heck happened to it? Uh, really? Oh, oh, here we go. Okay. <laughs> I found it. All right. This one. All right. So apparently, hold on a second. Things are slow. There we go. All right. Supposedly, Jeff, Jeff was building an altar in his house. It was going to be a stand and it's going to have skulls on it. And it's going to be, see, we have, this is his diagram, painted skulls and then this lamp and all this crap. Uh, she says this. Okay, this is true. It was my own private little world. This is true. I had complete control, complete control. Um, okay, she goes on to thinking about the abandonment thing again. Um, hold on a second. So, she was thinking that the reason he wanted to have this, this altar thing in his house was because he would put the pieces of his, his victims there, his favorite pieces, not just the skulls, but other favorite pieces. And that way, just like eating them, they would continue to be a part of him forever, that he would never be abandoned them because he would be melding with them. <laughs> no, that is not the issue in this case. In this case, this is an altar to his own ego. Look what I did. I controlled all of you. Here is what remains of you. And I can sit here and still jack off to all of your heads and your body parts. And I can fondle you and I can still enjoy you, even though you're not here anymore. The thrill I get out of knowing that Jeffrey Dahmer did get all of you, all of you. That is, a, that is an altar to himself, not that he needed, he wasn't feeling sorry for the victims or feeling like finally my, the victims are still here with me, they're my little friends. No, <laughs> he had no interest in a relationship. His, his only interest was that these were his. He finally got something and he kept it as long as he could keep it. And so to me, Jeffrey Dahmer doesn't have any of these personalities that they're talking about. Jeffrey Dahmer, is a psychopath. Now, I want to read some of the things I said about him right here. Uh, also, so here we go. Uh, let's see. Okay, I did that one. Okay. In reality, da uh, Dahmer was just a psychopath who didn't like it to reciprocate in a sexual relationship. He did not want a relationship. He did not even like to have to control a living victim. He just wanted total compliance without any pillow talk. 
He didn't want to submit to anybody in the bathhouses even. So he brought Halcyon to drug them and sexually assault them. I don't think he worried about people leaving him. I think he simply had no feeling for people at all. And he just used them when they were alive and found he liked them better dead. As I said before, he should have worked in a funeral home. Um, he wanted to make a sh shrine with his victim's skulls, and many think that is a kind of remembrance of them and his love for them, that they will be with him forever. Hell no. That was a shrine to himself, that he is crowing over the ultimate control he was able to achieve over another human being. He fooled the defense that the shrine was to meld himself with the victims by combining the favorite parts. Was he insane? And here's where it gets that's tricky. Was he insane at the time of the crime? The answer to that is he has to know the dif difference between right and wrong. Did he know it was wrong to commit these crimes? The answer to that is legally wrong. Now, in his own little personal world, he probably doesn't have a big issue with it. <laughs> that's why he does these things. He doesn't care about other humans, so I should be able to play God. But legally, did he know it was legally wrong? Yes, he did. And that's why he did it sneaky. That's why he covered up his crimes. And that's why, yeah, he knew when he did them that he was legally wrong. This is my reason for Ed, Ed, Andrea Yates too, which people want to give such a break to. When she committed the murdering of her children, she knew it was legally wrong. She made sure she had no one to interfere. She made sure she had time to get away with it. And then she killed him. She knew it was legally wrong. Now, so... The, de the definition of insanity, legal insanity, the legal definition, the criminal standard is that when you're doing it, you haven't a clue that what you're doing is wrong at all, that you don't even know legally what's right or wrong. Then you're totally freaking insane. Now we come to the difficult part, and this is something what many people are going to discuss. However, did he suffer from a mental illness such that he found his premeditated homicides something he couldn't resist because if he had a damaged way of thinking. Did he have a damaged way of thinking? Absolutely. Every serial killer does have a damaged way of thinking. Otherwise, you wouldn't think it's cool to rape and murder women. It wouldn't be, it's not cool to, to abduct little children and murder them. But even for Andrea Yates, it's not, if she had to have a damaged way of thinking to think this was something. Do, worth doing. She couldn't just leave the children and, and move away. She could have just said, I want a divorce. You can have the kids there, husband. And she could have left. She had to have a damaged way of thinking. How it got damaged is a whole nother kettle, shall we say. Was it damaged early on? Was it damaged along the way? Did she have ways to get away from her thinking? Did Dahmer have a way to get away from his thinking? We can argue that all the time. Are they damaged people in their men mental state and the way they think? Absolutely. Every single serial killer and killer and most people in prison who are criminals have a damaged way of thinking. Who decides it's okay to go out on the street and, and, and rob somebody at knife point? Hey, lady, give me your purse. That's, you have to have a damaged way of thinking to think that's okay. You have to have a damaged way of thinking and want to burglarize somebody's home. These are all damaged ways of thinking. So the question comes to this, is this insanity or is it just evil? This will always be a matter of contention because if, if one considers crime to be something a person does because of wrong thinking developed from birth or from family or society, then no criminal is truly responsible for their crimes. All should be considered, uh, all should be declared to have mental illness and all should be in psychiatric institutions and jails should not exist. So if it's all if it's all a mental disorder, uh, it, then nobody should be imprisoned for because they cannot control the way they think because that's what their brain is doing. So what ha what we end up with is this problem. We have to decide if humans are responsible for the acts or the rest of us are 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 criminals responsible for their acts or are we the entire society responsible for the criminals committing them. If we believe that we are all responsible for the criminals because of the what way they were, where they were born and and way they were raised and what the society has done, then no criminal should go to prison. They should all go to institutions where they can be helped psychiatrically before the return to society. Um, or we have to say, man does have free will. And in spite of his everything he's dealt with growing up, and the way he thinks, he still has the ability to choose right or wrong. And he still knows what the law is. And he's going to be responsible for that. So this is a really interesting conundrum. 
that we run into. But according to the legal law, the law, Jeffrey Dahmer knew what he was doing. He was not insane at the time he committed the crimes. Did he have psychiatric issues? Yes, I believe he's a psychopath, a 100% psychopath. And, um, and he killed 17 people to amuse himself, to make himself feel good. I believe he brought belongs in prison, but see, this is where the interesting arguments can come in. All right, that's my final statement on that. Let me see some more of your comments, and then we're going to have Benny join me uh, by phone, uh, which is going to be exciting. Uh, let me let me move back up here. Because insane and crazy are two different things. Well, see, this is, gets it gets tricky. It really does tricky. Uh, you you might be insane, but not legally insane. Yeah, that's legally. See the legal issue there, and then the question is, do we do we have that legal law or do we not have that legal law? Or do we, you know, do we change the law to say anybody commits a crime, we're going to put in a mental institution instead? You know, that, that's really, that's really, you know, that's where it gets interesting and what some people think. Um, what I certainly don't think was a proper, was proper was that Jeffrey Dahmer did committed three crimes and as a sex offender and wasn't put in prison away from people. So, you no, know, they people wouldn't get harmed. That 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 bothers me tremendously. Um, let's see. Uh, Bundy had an antisocial personality disorder, but wasn't insane. Well, again, again. See, this people give give people give Dahmer a break because he didn't. He wasn't like Bundy. Bundy, you no, know, lured women and then he raped and tortured them and and then strangled them with them looking in his eyes and he loved every minute of it. So we say, oh, so Bundy's a total psychopath. He's an evil man. Dahmer, oh, he's, he's a sick man. Okay, why isn't Bundy sick? I mean, what kind of person finds it something he really wants to do is to rape and murder women? What kind of person thinks that way? Again, he's got the same psychopathy problem he does. He wants power and control. He just gets his power and control in a different way than Dahmer. He likes to see his victims suffer. And Dahmer doesn't care about, because he has no relationship with them, he doesn't want to see them suffer. He just wants them to be unconscious so he can do what he wants to him he, he's not interested in the reaction they have D uh, bundy liked the reaction that was exciting to him so but which ones one is more evil one is more sick this question um so that's that's the issue over this um let's see uh it would be interesting to know, VLW says, of a case where insanity was a valid claim. I'd like to understand the difference better. Um, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to sit here and blank on, on actual cases. Um, I again, I don't think Andrea Yates was insane at the time she did it, although people will argue that. Um, there are people who don't seem to like they they've attacked people in the middle of the street, thinking they were they were um, Satan in the middle of the street or some kind of, you know, they, they, they literally attack somebody thinking that they're not humans, like they are zombies and running down the street. There've been a few cases of things like that and you go, wow, that person's really nuts. Um, so I'll have to think about that to figure out which one of these. <laughs> Maria says, I'm kidding, of course, I am, but I'm autistic and have ADHD, so I often feel crazy. But to me, I'm quite normal. <laughs> well, you know, this is an interesting point. I'm a, I, a lot of people consider me a little weird. I consider myself pretty normal for me. <laughs> so yes, it, the, the thing, the line comes down to is how are we, are we harming others? That's what the line is. Um, and, and psychopaths don't have any empathy, so they don't care if they harm others. But people who have certain issues, shall we say, um, the question is how how much are they harming other people with those issues, and are if, do they recognize even hurting other people with those issues? That that's that gets into a whole nother wicket. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. Uh, Helen says, surely a genuine insanity plea would be one where the person who committed the crime wouldn't normally behave like that if they were medicated appropriately. Well. Um, yeah, I, I see your point. So if somebody is like, people say, you know, it just because you're schizophrenic doesn't mean you're killing off people. Uh, but there are definitely people who are schizophrenic who aren't on their meds, who do not see reality at all. 
they are so confused about reality. They're talking to people who aren't there. So I would go with that. I would go with that. That 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 I'll, I'll, I think I'd, I'd aim toward that. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, Lisa N says, there are some uh, YouTube videos showing police interviews of genuinely insane killers. They don't try to cover it up and just tell the police what they did. Rare, but they're out there. Yeah, it, but you have to be careful. Did, why are they even in police custody? Is it because the police already know what they did? Like Dahmer, once they found all of Dahmer's body parts in his, his apartment, he's not, he can't lie about it. There's no point in it. He's, yeah, well, they, he'll tell everything. So the same thing. Why is that person in police custody? Are they just then trying to pretend they're insane because they got caught or are they really insane? So that's, that's a question. Um, let's see. Oh, 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 hold on a second. Oh, I almost put somebody in. Oh, I almost put you in timeout by hitting the wrong button. Um, you have a high IQ. Well, that's good. <laughs> that, always, that always helps. Um, let's see. Um, Lisa S. says, I think sometimes we have such a difficult time accepting these crimes that we try and look for etiology or just say they're insane. It's, it is extraordinarily difficult to understand why anybody would want to do anything like this. It just, but the complete lack of empathy. Jo Jeffrey Dahmer never cared about the lives of the people he killed. That all of these young men had hope for the future. They had plans, they, were, they had families, they had, and they got snuffed out by this piece of crap just because he wanted a body to play with. That's how shallow he is in his thinking, how little he cared about another human being. He also, he claimed he loved his mother and father and grandmother, but he did nothing, and his brother, but he never did anything to make them proud. He just did things behind their backs and he used them as, um, as many do as, as dupes because they needed a place to live. They need money. They, they, it's a cover for them as well. So if you really loved your family, you wouldn't do this crap. You don't love them. He never did. And and Lionel Dahmer wants to believe his son loved him. But I'm telling you, Lionel, sorry to say this, but your, your son could give a crap about you. And you should probably not give a crap about him. Um, so let's see what you got here. Um, this is very true. Insane or not, society needs protection from them. Yes, they do. Absolutely. Um, uh, he made jokes about what he'd done to the victims while he was in prison. I know I'm not entirely sure about this. I, I'm not, I know that the movie presented that, uh, the Netflix movie pre series presented that, but supposedly that wasn't true. So I don't know how much he actually made fun of them during when he was in the prison. Um, he was a sadist. Well, in a weird, there was a couple times, there was one time where he was like mocking the guy before, as he, before he killed him, that he was going to eat his heart. So that is sadistic. Um, most of the time they were dead before he did anything, which means he's not so sadistic, but Sadism is a matter of enjoyment. It just wasn't his version of enjoyment to speak of. It wasn't because, again, he cared about the other person um, more than a sadist would. A sadist likes to see people suffer. That gives him the power and control. Dahmer just wasn't into that, but that doesn't mean he was any kind of better human being. <laughs> um, do you think, uh, Maui Swift says, do you think they purposely put Dahmer in general population knowing something would happen? Um, I, I would say that they may not have put him purposely there, but they may not have been too concerned if something did happen. Oh, shucks. I think they were sick of him. So yeah, I'm not saying they did or didn't, but they probably knew there were enough other people there wanted to off him just for the fun of it. So, <laughs> um, let's see. Um, uh, Uh, I did a thing on this show. The guy went to Mexico, killed his kids because they were aliens or something. I did a, I, I did a thing on him. Um, I'm not sure where it is, but I did do something on him. And that's a, it's a, the Jeffrey Ike one uh, video. Uh, if you look, put Pat, profile of Pat Brown and, and is it, I'm sorry, is it, no, wait, wait a minute, what's his name? Ike, not Jeffrey, it's not Jeffrey Ike. What's his name? I've forgotten. Um, hold on, I gotta look it up now because I, but I did a video on that. Um, uh, let me find out what it was. What's his name? David Ike. Sorry, David Ike. I did a video on that. So you put in the search engine criminal uh, profiler Pat Brown and David Ike, I C K E. You'll see, you'll find the video I did on that. Um, let's see. Uh, da, 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 um, 
going back to the, um, perhaps murderers who are diagnosed as paranoid schizophrenic are found not guilty by reason of insanity, but I can't think of an example. Yeah. Uh, it, then again, you have, depends who, who diagnoses you. And I, clearly there are paranoid schizophrenics in the world um, because I have somebody who uh, email has emailed me 200 times and I'll guarantee you from reading her stuff, she's totally schizophrenic and she is totally divorced, completely divorced from reality. Um, uh, I've never responded to her and yet she thinks I'm her best friend <laughs> and she's helping solve cases and everything she writes is complete word salad and it makes no sense. So she needs meds. Um, but she's apparently not on them. So the, clearly there are people who have conditions. Uh, the, most of the time they're not violent. So the question is when they are violent, you know, what's being done about that. Um, so there could be a legitimate insanity thing if that person really, really, really didn't do. Um, Steven Steinberg case. I'll have to look that one up. I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that. Um, so uh, a lot, sometimes it depends again whether the person is using that to justify their, their the murder that they're going they're committing and really questionable. <laughs> okay, so this is going to end this portion. Benny is going to call in now.